To celebrate publishing over 100 episodes of the Fishing the DMV podcast and surpassing 2,000 subscribers on YouTube, I am giving away a free guided fishing trip with Billy Coles of Smith Mountain Lake Fishing Guide Services. The giveaway will run through Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th, and I'm going to give you three unique opportunities to win the fishing trip. Number one, the number one way that you can enter the competition is by leaving a review of the show at Apple Podcasts. After the review at the very bottom, comment hashtag fishing the DMV and you're automatically entered in the sweepstakes. Number two, commenting on every video that I drop from Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th. And then at the end of your comment, leave hashtag fishing the DMV. And then you're again entered to win the competition. Number three, the final way that you can enter a chance to win is by ordering online from Jake's Bait and Tackle. Every online order through them automatically enters you with a chance to win as long as you leave the hashtag fishing the DMV. The contest again runs through Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th. Good luck. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Start this off. If you could, perfect word, what would be your perfect camera setup? I don't know. How's that for an intro to fishing show? (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'd I'd have to have about, I don't know. What family would you stay in? I'd probably switch to Sony. Really? I think they've got pretty good mirrorless technology, at least from what I've dabbled in. Um, I think they kind of, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I like my Nikon too, because I figured it out. It's like, you know, graph on your boat. What graph are you choosing? It's the one you're most comfortable with. And that's like going through settings. Hummingbird would be my easiest option. Uh, I like my Garmin because LiveScope's awesome. Um, and then Lawrence, you've got to be a rocket scientist to have that thing figured out. So at least for me, but I didn't grow up using a Lawrence. So it would be something I'm most comfortable with, probably Nikon. I mean, we talk about that comfort zone, but then getting out of your comfort zone. And this time last year, you came on the show um, after, if I, and I'm not mistaken, you slept in and you had breakfast and then you wanted the Potomac river. And now this year you go down to Lake Anna and you crack a victory again, the first tournament. What is it with you and first tournament wins? I don't know. Uh, truth be told, I don't, um, I, so truth be told, I never planned on fishing Lake Anna for that tournament. I was 100% dedicated to going to the Potomac and running miles and miles to some different areas that I know are good springtime producers in preparation for the KBF event. And then I was rudely reminded that, oh yeah, I can't go on the Potomac because it's in the off limits status. And, uh, but I had already, I love going fishing. So Uh, I saw that NVKBA had their season opener on Lake Anna and it gained a ton of traction. And um, before I bet on anybody, I'm going to bet on myself and threw my hat into the ring and just went fishing. So did you practice at all before this event or did you just kind of go into it um, just clean, no practice and just hit on the water? I know I never went. I, Truth be told, I didn't really even know there was a tournament there until I think the Wednesday before, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I've, I've had history with Lake Anna. Um, I've had a lot of trips of learning to what not to do on that body of water. Um, but I haven't really, uh, I don't know. I've kind of fished in the springtime, the upper reaches, the lower reaches. And then this time I said, well, I'm going to go to the middle because both of the options before didn't pan out as well as I thought they would. And, um, you know, just kind of made it happen. Um, I made, I'm what helped me on this event is I made some really critical decisions throughout the day that changed the dynamic of the day for me. Well, we got to go through them then. Like, cause 
I mean, 88 inches out of that, which I believe is a 17 inch average for five fish limit out of Lake Anna, when I think there was like, what, 600 boats and kayaks on that day or would, would have gone if the weather was even better than it was. So mm-hmm. it's a pressured lake, uh, especially in the spring. So yeah, I mean, just walk us through your day. How did it go? Uh, well, NVKBA has what I think is actually a pretty cool rule. Um, they allow you to launch basically at any time. You could launch at midnight, essentially, um, if you wanted to. You know, so long that I think the rules are no active graphing, obviously no fishing. Um, and, you know, you can go make it to your spot. And I kind of played pin the tail on the donkey uh, with my launch. I said I just want to go to kind of a middle section of the lake. Um, did some s- small map study at the house. I kind of figured they'd be in a spawning pattern. Um Turns out I was a little off on that. I think it's still very pre-spawn in the area I fished anyhow. Um, but when I was launching or when I had pulled up to the ramp, you know, I got to a ramp and there was a, there's quite a few anglers launching there. Some had already launched and then, you know, you just see the, uh, 360 degree lights kind of just pilfering off into the uh, darkness, you know, before I launched and I'd launched right before lines in. So six, I don't know. Maybe I launched at 20, 20 after six or something like that. And I headed to the first Creek that I had kind of thought would be okay. And there was, I think two, two kayaks ahead of me going in there. Um, and by the time that I had made it to an area, um, I saw there was a kayak in the very, very back of the Creek that I kind of, I was hoping to get to, but, uh, you I guess you got to get there a little earlier than I did. Um, and I just found a kind of a small pocket. Uh, I don't even know if I'd call it a secondary point, but there was a deep pocket that ran in between a, what I would consider a spawning flat with deep water access near to it. And in my head, that is a perfect storm for where fish should be this time of year. Access to deep water. Um, a nice flat and structure, which there was a wood, wood seawall bulkhead, um, you know, that had some pretty large poles, uh, the water clarity in that area. I wasn't able to assess whether beds were being made. Um, but third or fourth cast, I don't know, right off the get go, I'd caught a, you know, a smaller fish and I caught a ton of. 12 to 14 inch fish right off the get-go. Uh, I, when, when they're biting like that, uh, even though they're not big, I generally don't upload after every fish I catch. Um, that's the Potomac angler in me. If there's an active bite going on, you're fishing, not uploading, uh, you're not uploading pictures. Don't waste your time with that. You've got all day to do that. Uh, it's not a sandbagging thing. It's just, a you can't catch a fish if you're fiddling with your phone. And I think I, I'm going to say eight o'clock, but I think it was a little bit earlier than that. I had, uh, I had caught my limit and they were all small fish. Um, but it was a limit nonetheless. And I'll say it in kayak fishing, a limit of 12 inches early is the best safety net you can ever have because there's nothing worse than having four nice fish and searching for a fifth later on in the day. So once I had that limit done, Mm -hmm. I felt comfortable. I felt really good. I was like, great. Now I get to slow down and really start just picking a place apart. Um, When did you have your limit by specifically on the, uh, on the clock? On the clock. I don't know. I'd have to look, but it was before eight o'clock dang dude that's impressive yeah it was it was early but nothing big it was a small limit i think low 70s but or, still yeah no so, <laughs> especially for lake anna that has never done that to me so my presumption of that area was correct where it became decision making time is when i sat there and you know it started to get to be 15 or 20 minutes between bites where it was a little bit faster and furious earlier on in the day 
I was noticing a trend. I was like, I'm not getting the bigger bites, which is telling me that those males, the bucks have moved up. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't finding any bigger fish to follow. The females. Yeah. So I started kind of working that deeper channel out and I was actively scanning and trying to graph anything and I just couldn't pick anything up. Um, so I kind of just called an audible, um, and I was near a large bridge on Lake Anna, and I'm sure people could probably figure out where that is without telling them where it is, um, that has a lot of riprap and deep water next to it. And that's kind of where I thought maybe I'll just head out there. I love to crank in the spring. It's fun. It's my favorite. One of my favorite ways to catch a fish is deep diving crankbaits. Um, now, I wouldn't consider a DT-10 deep diving to my standards, but to other standards, maybe so. Um, but I, I went to the riprap and started cranking and kind of developed a pattern on big fish. It wasn't a super awesome lights out pattern but it was a pattern that held up so how did you find your initial spot was it through map study was it to use panoptics to help you make those decisions um you know i i i every year i try to do something to improve as an angler and last year i just basically sold my soul to to learning BFS equipment, bait caster finesse system. And then this year it's basically living and dying with live scope to understand live scope, not to be as good as, you know, a McCluskey or a Mulligan, but to, to really understand where it's implemented. And the one thing I started to figure out a little bit in my first tournament this year is like, I don't have to see bass hit my jerk bait on it, but I can use it as a tool to eliminate water. Is that something that you did in this tournament? Yeah. Uh, a little. I would I would be a liar if I say it didn't come in handy in a in in a couple situations, but uh, I think a lot of people get this reality that oh you've got live scope oh you're just you're just looking at everything that's yes. swimming out there and I think maybe you going through the learning process of live scope can dispel that rumor that is that that is not as easy as what people want you to believe. I got my ass kicked uh, <laughs> twice. <laughs> <laughs> Am I becoming co more comfortable with it? Absolutely. Um, for those that say it's live scope, um, I will tell you that instinct trumps live scope every day of the week. Um, and that's something that I'm trying to work on. I could care less about the live scope, but making those critical decisions on a tournament day, when to pack it or when to park it, you know, is kind of become something I'm more focused on is time management, things like that. Um, but so for this tournament, you used more instinct than using your graphs to help you locate the juice. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I don't know. Uh, and I will, I will always say that, um, my mantra when I go out on the water is for what I lack in skill, I will make up with my work ethic. Um, I kind of live by an idea that I will cast a hundred more times than you. Um, when, when I go out on the water that <laughs> I don't, I don't play with my phone. I don't. I rarely eat a ton, which is not good. Sometimes I don't drink anything, which screwed me on the Potomac because at day one, um, throughout the process of sucking, um, my bullheadedness, you know, just didn't drink any water, didn't take care of myself. And that's a better balance that I'm, that I'm working on too. But yeah, instinct, um, and just m making better game time decisions. Now you caught your bigger fish switch into the rip wrap, going to that pre-spawn more of a pattern or mindset. Was there a lot of people running that kind of same pattern or in that, what you believe by looking at them like a pre-spawn mode? No, <laughs> which for me was an absolute blessing. Um, 
I watched a hundred boats run into that Creek throughout the day in and out, you know, sometimes the same boat would leave, you know, come in and fish for a half hour, run out and come back in two hours later and do the same thing throughout the day. I don't know what other kayak angler was in the Creek with me, but they could attest that it was chaos. And there were two boats throughout the entire day that spent a total of less than 10 minutes touching what I was fishing. So it was phenomenal for me because they're probably looking at me like this idiot. What is he doing? You know, <laughs> uh, but I didn't have to fight well, for a position. I didn't. Why do you to... think that is? Because so I think, in, I think personally that certain parts of that lake are in spawning mode. And I mm. think also at any minute on it, I mean, I was looking at in that Creek 59, it, it was so close to 60 degree water. You could taste it. They're going to pop. It could happen at any moment. And that's what I think those boats were doing is just like, you know, especially local guys that have much more knowledge than I do on that body of water. Like, 60 degrees, bass are spawning. I don't care what anybody says. They are pre, they're in a full-blown pre-spawn or they are spawning. Or they should be. Um, mm -hmm. And it just, it wasn't, it might have worked for some people, but, it, you know, my idea to leave that creek pocket and go back to what I was doing, I was reminded that it was a good decision multiple times of a day seeing the same boat coming in, leaving coming back for more, leaving. And I'm under the assumption that if you go in and out of a place that many times, something's not working for you, but you're looking for something that will work. You know what I mean? So. I, I agree with that, that you got to fear the person that never leaves a creek. Yeah, for <laughs> or, sure. Or never leaves a grass bed. There's something scary. He's he's either so far off in left field or he's going to win the tournament. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I so I, I found the river fisherman in me picked up on a, on a little deal on that bridge. And I, the current direction running through the bridge was telling me that they were drawing water due to the, like I said, the direction or the wind was creating a current scene. But I, I found mm -hmm. a, I found a neat little, um, bite that I think it would be tough to replicate, but it was, uh, it was, it was pretty interesting. Um, there, there was definitely a current seam running through an area within that riprap. And if you can imagine it from a bass's standpoint, especially a bass that is, you know, trying to attack and gouge absolutely everything it can right before it spawns it's a feed shoot for them. They sit back in the current slack and ambush absolutely everything that swims by them. And that's kind and, of and where I was. Let's presenting. also be real here. A, and I was going to say, let's be like real here, like a riprap bridge for pre-spawn. Like that's never one of Bassmaster classic ever. <laughs> like, right. It, it is, it, it, it is such a great spot. And to me, the interesting thing is being in the moment there because, you know, two a week ago, two weeks ago, I, I did a fishing report on Lake Anna with a guy that lives on the lake. And he talked about like, yeah, like they're going to pop any day now. It's close. They're going to be doing this diff different sectors. So this is where it's like listening to a fishing report or doing some due diligence is important. However, once you get on the water, metal, metal meets the meat. That's when you got to be able to block out those voices in your head and be able to live in the moment and still like, what is the water telling me though? What is nature telling me at this moment? And it sounds like you did that better than anyone else in the kayak tournament. Yeah. I, I try and, you know, it's, it's, they're, they're good and make you feel good, warm and fuzzies, but I think reading into fishing reports and, um, listening to how others caught them. I mean, it doesn't do you any justice. You know, you, you've got to evaluate and make your own determinations on what these fish are doing. Sometimes it works like it did, but sometimes you get your butt whooped and I get my butt whooped. Like mind you, 
the week before I had just gotten back from the Santee Cooper lakes where I got my butt whipped, um, some kind of fears. And I'm telling you, I fished that body of water for five days straight and never caught a fish over 18 inches. And I fished Santee Cooper well. I cashed a check last year at the BOS. Um, completely different. I, I've, I've done well there for multiple years. It's one of my favorite places to fish. And I ran every pattern that I've ever developed on that lake and nada. I mean, I caught fish, but she was bad to me. So I kind of, I don't know, I had a chip on my shoulder the following week and I said, I'm going to do things my way and, you know, um, do it, you know, do it the way I want to do it come hell or high water. But, um, it was, it's fun for me. I, I, Cranking largemouth bass is one of my favorite ways to catch them, especially deep cranking. And uh, we talk about a body of water earlier, a uh, little Seneca. And that's a place that I, 10XD, look it up. It's, it's very hard to fish on a kayak and uh, it drags you all over the place and makes you know your arm scream at the end of the day but there's no better feeling than catching a big bass on that so and, and that was going to be my next question is when people think kayaking um especially in this area i get it you know if you're fishing the the hobie bos and you're down in like alabama and tennessee but you're a Maryland boy and you know, I'm a Northern Virginia guy. Like we don't, you don't think, you know, the title Potomac, you know, you're going to be running a 16, 20 XD down there. So little Seneca is kind of where, or places like that where you can actually hone that craft. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I did, this was years ago back when the state challenges for, so KBF run state challenges. Um, and years ago, that was one of the ways that you could qualify for the national championship. This was before BOS, before Bass had a kayak series. And KBF was a staple. And I'm talking about like you'd have a national championship in Caddo Lake. And there was like 470 anglers. You know what I mean? Like that was the crown jewel. Um, so you would fish state challenges to try and, um, you know, qualify if you want a state challenge for a monthly you would qualify you know, would secure your qualification for the national championship and then you could also do it through your uh your home club that you were fishing but it was it was difficult you know to qualify through the club so you know you would why not fish the monthly challenges as well to try and get a championship and i went to I had the best day deep cranking on little Seneca that I've ever had in my life. I don't know. I was fishing with Dave Thompson and I hung 98 inches in a day on little Seneca. Holy shit. That's insane. Yeah, that was, that was awesome. And then I needed one 19 inch fish to break me over the hundred inch mark for the month. And I ended up catching that on the Potomac. So, um, but yeah, one day, mm. It was, uh, it was lights out. That place has big fish. I hate to, you know, I won't tell you where to go or what to do. You'll have to do that yourself, but <laughs> it's an awesome body of water. It's not easy. And it, it's not always nine, you know, I've gone to that place and got the old, you know, so, um, but yeah, it's, it's like any other place. And then, you know, you know, guys, I'll be shooting a hidden gym episode there, um, here shortly. So to give that whole rundown, so don't worry about that. But that's just so interesting. Like it's an electric motor only lake. And I think those honestly do have a self-protection thing because it's so niche to have guys that have a Torquedo or electric motor, a big e-tech motor on the back of their boat. And if you have a, you know, 22 foot Skeeter, that's just not a conducive boat for that kind of lake to be able to get around the whole thing easily. So I do think electric motor only lakes kind of protect themselves a little bit compared to something where you can just hammer down. Yeah. It's so that lakes, you know, it's, it's a busy lake though, especially in the summertime. There's a lot of um, recreational craft out there as well. 
which is similar to like Aquaquan mm-hmm. Reservoir, you know, where you have the paddle teams out there, um, yeah, you know, cutting through everywhere, and it's you know it's kind of chaos out there. Um, but it's it's a very very <laughs> every cove is different, which is so fun because it like you get to change your variety of fishing. Um, you know, one cove will have deep grass, the other cove will be gravel, the other cove will be it's flooded timber. You know, it's the cornucopia of however you want to catch them, so long as you don't want to catch them shallow. If you want to catch fish shallow in Maryland, fish the Potomac. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> so, besides Little Seneca um, and Lake Anna and the Potomac, where else have you been fishing lately? Um,. Well, I haven't done a ton of fishing, truth be told, uh, this year because I've been busy with hockey and all other things. And I I struggle anymore to do wintertime fishing around here. I know. I don't know. I used to be able to, like, slay the dragon and go out there and bundle up and fish 10-degree weather. didn't matter, so long as it <laughs> wasn't frozen. I was I would fish it anymore. I'm just to a point in my life where I'm like, I'll go to Florida. You know, I, I need to like go south or you know. Jeff Little cries do, a little bit when you say that. Yeah, no, and, and I, me and him have had that conversation. That guy, I've often said, I don't know where he gets it from, um, but I, I I envy him. There and there's a listen like. I've got my idols locally, um, Mm -hmm. anglers that I put up here. And those are the guys, you know, Jeff Little can go out and, uh, you know, sub freezing temperatures. And he's out there with like his ball cap was like a little beanie over the top with his ears still exposed. And I'd be like full balaclava with like my eyes showing from it and uh, just hoping that we would get off the water soon um and i that i just can't anymore like i don't know what it is and i've got all the right gear i've got a dry suit got a very stable kayak i've got you know the best hand you know warming systems gloves fingerless you know switch them out wool non-wool polyester and i just can't get into it but i like I said, I think the other part of it too is I coach hockey in the winter and that Saturday at 8 a.m. in the morning and Sunday at 7 in the morning. So by the time I'm out of that, I'm pretty well wore out and, you know, traveling somewhere far as out of the picture. So does your son and you fish at all? No, not well. I take that back. He does. Um, we go down to a little local reservoir down the road from me occasionally and i do the hook and bobber with the zebco and he goes and catches you know 30 or 40 bluegill sunnies and i always Dude, stop awesome. him i always stop him before he's tired of doing it right because I don't want it to seem like, come on, you're coming to do my, I don't, I don't fish. I am a hundred percent his, you know, helping him bait the hook, take the fish off, release the fish. I don't have an extra rod. I'm out, not out there casting. He's my a hundred percent focus. And I always want him. I always want to stop him before he says, I'm bored. I want to go home. I always want him to say one more cast. One more of this, one more of that. But it's fishing is my passion. It doesn't have to be his. Of course, as a parent, I want him to love it, but I'm not going to force him to love it. That is very sobering, and I really like to hear you say that. Um, you know, for, for guys that follow the channel, you know that for the last 16 years of my life, I was a strength and conditioning coach, really big into travel sports, Northern Virginia baseball, stuff like that. And there's this need for the youth that if you do something, you have to be balls to the wall all in. If you're going to do travel hockey, well, you have to be on seven teams 
and have practiced three times a day, every day, 24 seven. And to hear you say that is so alien to me with the parents I dealt with for 16 years where it's like, I want them to still be hungry. I want to, I, I don't want to just do it 24 seven. I want, I want them to still have that hunger. And I really wish more people had that view on, on all youth sports, not just fishing of you don't have to just because they have talent in it. We have to OD on it. You can go too far that way. <laughs> yeah. It, it, there's, there's a fine balance. Um, I, I deal with it with myself with burnout from fishing generally by the time the season's over because I, I'm a tournament angler. You know, I enjoy fishing tournaments. Part of it is the camaraderie. Part of it's the competitiveness. I was in sports all growing up. Um, and the other part of it's the fishing aspect. And you kind of get the, the mesh of all of those together. And I think uh, there's some mental tear, you know. They always say in tournament fishing, you know, you got to have a short memory. You know, have a bad tournament. It's got to be out of your mind by the time that your boat's loaded on the trailer and you're heading home. It's not as easy. Um, it's hard when you have small children, but for me as a parent, for him, um, I, now when he says, dad, I want to go fishing. It's like, we stop everything we're doing. Cause I'm like, sure. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah like, let's go. Um, but I, <laughs> you don't never, have to go to school today. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, you're going to go to school, but you'll, <laughs> you'll never, I'll never let him get to the point to where he's bored. I want him saying oh come on one more one more and say nah we'll get them next time you know let's leave them be we've caught enough you know to try and ignite because i'd love uh man uh this is gonna dovetail into another topic and i'm gonna jump into it real quick because i like i think it's so awesome nvkba is like an awesome they're a great organization. They run they they run things so well. It's a very, very, we're blessed. We have so many good organizations around here. Um, but the ringleader of NVKBA, Mike Ortega, awesome guy. Mike. Yes. Um, but what I want to hit on is his son, Riley, has been fishing NVKBA since he was just I mean, he was out there in a kayak, and it was like, God, if a stiff breeze comes up, this kid's screwed because he's going, you know. And I saw him again at the tournament this week, and I was like, he's not a kid anymore. He's like a – he's a man. And, I, you know, I talked to him a little bit, yeah. and he's got fire. Like, he's always had fire. I've watched him. I think he's a great angler. Not a kid anymore. He's a young man. And I love that aspect about seeing that next generation – like come in and I hope that Riley doesn't lose his competitive edge or his love um, for tournament fishing, because I'm going to say this right now, and hopefully I can come back to this in the historicals within this year is that what Riley needs is one good finish and everybody else is going to oh. get put on check because that's what he's missing right now. And he's fully capable of it. I know he is. He is missing one good finish, and it's lights out after that. Watch out, everybody. That's your new young gun. And I'm saying that right now, and I hope I hope to God he doesn't stop because he's right there. And, and he handles adversity so well. The Lake Anna tournament, it's always something happens. And, of course, his dad's trying to run the event, and his – trolling motor or something uh, the the plug stopped working or something so he was back to paddling well it was super windy i mean it's like you know sometimes you have Hell. to paddle i get that but like you know facing adversity on the water and still trying to salvage a decent day is tough and it's easy to get discouraged and i hope he doesn't because um and he has to be an eyesight of his dad you know which is tough when your dad's judging fish or you know running a tournament and you can't explore like you want to um so he's gonna he's gonna do well at a tournament and he's gonna put us all on check mark my words and basically doing and i'm just i don't i don't know him as well but i just know from working with with young athletes for so long that's that's any sport by the way 
with 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 so many kids where it's like you you haven't had that first taste of success and you doubt yourself you doubt your abilities hockey football baseball fishing doesn't matter it's with everyone until you get that first big w and it's the same thing with like you know i revert back to my hitters be like yeah you struck out three or four times in a row that doesn't mean the process is wrong you know you just hit the ball to the same guy three times that doesn't mean you know or, or whatever it is like once you get that first base hit and then you're like oh i can do this then it's a second then it's a third then all of a sudden you're back to where you were and and a lot of it is psychology and a lot of it's just bad luck and i think we do in any sport we get in our head so freaking much and as a young kid or and or a young kid at heart and you're getting into fishing until you have that first finish and you can be like oh i belong here and once you have that it it's just so much easier it really is yeah no it it is when i first started kayak bass fishing and mind you i'm from the midwest i didn't fish for bass growing up i fished for walleye and yellow perch and panfish and all the great little critters that swim around in <laughs> you know the prairie pothole region of the u.s uh, but I started bass fishing when I moved out here because I was close to the Potomac and I always grew up watching Bassmaster fish Potomac. And I was like, well, I'm here. Might as well learn something. I don't know. And the, you know, the walleye population in Southern Maryland is non-existent. So, <laughs> but when I started fishing, I was served such a healthy dose of humble pie from one individual. And his name's Jedediah Plunker. And if you don't know the guy, you haven't been here long. Because Jedediah, say that again. Jedediah Plunkard? Jed Plunkert. Jed Plunkard. Yeah. He he was the guy at the tournament that would win every event. Um and, and you would just get humbled day in and day out. It was just like, God. But he was so good at winning. And what I mean by that is humble in victory, humble in defeat. If he lost, he'd be the first person to shake whoever's hand. There's not, in my opinion, there's not a better angler in a plastic boat in this region than Jed Plunker. Hands down. And I'm thrilled to call him a friend, a mentor, whatever you want to call it. Um, but he taught me so much about being a steward of the sport more so than a competitor of the sport. Um, of, you know, it's not all about you. It's, it's about the sport as a whole. It's about everybody. And one of the coolest things that I've ever seen in the sport and I've seen a lot of cool things, but like witness firsthand is we had a young angler. I don't know. I'm going to say somewhere between 12 and 14 years old, show up to an event. And this was at Rocky Gorge and Jed won the event. And this was back when Warner paddles was handing out like these awesome, really nice paddles to, you know, tournament winners or whatnot. And this young angler was with his mother and his mother had to chase him around all day, blah, 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 this. And by the time they got back, they were whooped. And make a long story short, when Jed won that paddle, he took the paddle, you know, and said, you know, whatever, and walked it over to that young angler and was like, here, this is yours. And I was like, how That's awesome so cool. is that? You know, it was like such a awesome like little thing and i try my hardest to mimic you know whenever i do have success it's you know i'm, I'm appreciative of it but i want to give back to the sport too so do you think jed would be interested or willing or to come on the show yeah i think so i jed's an awesome great great guy i i can reach out to him for you yeah because like that's something i'm trying to do on the show to do more is little biopics on on local legends like i think i don't know if you saw i had like charlie taylor on who's meant a lot to a lot of people yeah um in the area and i think there's a lot of people like that that people need to know who they are because they've made a difference in so many people's lives and i was really touched by that when i did the charlie taylor one and there's so many people who are like oh he helped me fish and i'm like yeah, how many mentors are out there There's that have time. changed so many people's lives? Yeah. I mean, I I am very green 
when it comes to the kayak scene in Maryland. Um, there's there are so many people that have helped me um, take me under their wing and teach me not only the kayak side, but a little bit more of the life side. Um, Bear Wenzel, that's another phenomenal angler. Um, awesome guy, cool cat, you know, just kind of the life of the party. Um, it, you know, and I think their lives have shifted to a point where they're no longer, um, you know, competing like on a full-time basis. But if you see their mm. names pop up on a tournament, you know you've got your hands full. Um, Bear's a <laughs> Bear introduced me to the Susquehanna River years ago, um, and he also pulled a uh, a large treble hook out of my hand with the old braid trick. You know, you just you know yank it out. Oh, there so. you go, memories. <laughs> yeah, like no good guy. Um, there's there's so many so many good people in this industry, you know, and I like talking about those people. I don't like talking about myself. I like talking about the people who got me here. The reason I'm sitting in front of you is because so many other people, I didn't do it on my own. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, this is, uh, it's such a cool industry. And, you know, on the national level, you have the people that you resonate with when you travel to tournaments. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's good to, it's good to find good people and to kind of latch onto them and learn from them. No, and it's something that we need to do a better job of raising awareness because it's so easy for people to 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 ring the bells for the the national guys, the ones that are big there. But what gets lost is the grassroots and the people that helped us start because not everyone's national based, but everyone started somewhere and everyone had a person that helped them get started. And so, you know, and this goes to everyone that's actually listening as well or watching on YouTube. Please feel free to email me if you think you have somebody that's like, hey, this person was really big in our community and we'd like to get him out there. Um, and I would love to talk to anyone that, that's made a difference in people's lives because they need to have the bells rung and they need to be sung their praises. Um, where was I going with this? I freaking forget crap, right? Oh, um, what I was curious with this, what modifications do you make to your, you're writing a Hobie pro this year, correct? Like last year? Pro angler. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. What do you make any modifications or anything different when you fish the Susky or smallmouth waters compared to a Lake Anna or a tidal Potomac really chop wind boat traffic? No, my setup's pretty much the same. Um, I don't, I so I have the three six the Hobie three hundred and sixty degree Mirage Drive, um, and, and I feel like it's such an advantage. Um, I really do. I mean, what that drive is, and I'm not saying that because I'm a Hobie spoke person. I was on Wilderness Systems fishing team, um, and as a matter of fact, I'm staring right now on the back side of the screen. I have my kayaks up. Uh, wilderness systems attack 140 which is like my favorite platform to fish out of um it's 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 a rocket ship um paddles great blah 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 uh but what the mirage 360 drive allows me to do for instance on the riprap and when you're pulling like deep cranks people wouldn't think that a deep diving crankbait would be able to turn the trajectory of your kayak to a disadvantage. Well, with that drive, I'm actually able to counterintuitively work against the crankbait to keep my heading in the same direction, which also helps, you know, my graphing and things like that. So especially like jerkbait fishing and stuff like that, I can keep my heading the same with very easy adjustments. So I don't feel like I need to, I don't, oh, I mean, in some standards, I probably overrig a kayak, but I think for the most part, I I run a very basic, you know, setup with you know a Torquedo motor, uh, Power Pole Micro, which I use mainly at the Potomac because a place like Anna, where it's you know gets deep quick, I, I didn't find you know I don't find many advantages of it it's nice to have but um you know it's just another thing to add in the morning um but yeah no nothing nothing out of the ordinary how do you adjust 
I think now, this is my hypothesis, and I could be wrong, and that's why I got the pro here to tell me if 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 my thought process is off. The cranking setup that I've fallen in love with, I feel like works better on a boat than it does a kayak. And then I was talking to someone offhandedly, I think it was at the kayak show that I went to, um, and they're like, yeah, you got to set up your gear a little bit differently in a kayak than a boat because the boat's not moving necessarily. The kayak, when you set into them or something, it it's you're moving a little bit more. Do you have a, a stiffer crankbait setup than maybe you would have in a boat? Because I usually am running like an eight foot uh, medium. It's basically a medium crank rod is what I got with a slow reel. And that on a boat for me has been deadly. And I, have, I have confidence with it, but I just feel like it doesn't, I can't make it work in a kayak. I think I'm just losing a lot of fish. Yeah. So you said it best. I think as far as the rod goes, um, I run an iRod, the crank launcher out of the Genesis 2 series, uh, or I'm sorry, Genesis 3 series. And um, there are certain rods that are better than others. I've had to figure out how to adapt a different way of cranking versus that you would do typically from a boat. Um, so that I, you know, I've got the trajectory for a hook set. Um, but I, I think the slower reel uh, is, is, is obviously key. Um, but having a rod that almost, I don't know, I, I, I'd like to think my rod, you know, when you're pulling a deep diving crankbait, there's really no setting the hook. Like the rod should almost, and the, and the weight of that lure, you know, pulling through the water almost sets itself. There's really no you know extreme hooks that like you would have on a jig or something texas rigged you know it almost sets itself there's a ton of pressure on those baits initially just the way i see it is you've got a a a bill that's pulling through the water very hard and it's diving and as soon as you release that bill pressure from pulling through the water you know and a fish hits it and shoots that bill forward. Now all of a sudden, all that pressure diving turns into forward pressure, and I think it sets the hook almost. It should, with a decent rod, set the hook for itself. Not saying you have to not lean into it as much, but I, I think for the most part, when I'm cranking, I'm not really setting the hook. I struggle more with uh, that lure pulling the kayak around. And, and so what it sounds like you're telling me is like, you don't have to change your equipment. If you're going from a boat to a kayak, the biggest thing is boat control that, you know, if you don't have boat control, that's where it's going to be an issue with the equipment that you have rod wise and tackle wise for your crankbait setup. Yeah. And, 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 and learning, you know, learning how to be comfortable throwing from a seated position. So in the 360 drive, obviously I have to be seated. Um, whereas in a boat, you know, standing over a trolling motor, you've got a standing, you know, position that you can keep the rod tip lower to the water, um, you know, and, and crank to try and make it easier on your life. Cause deep cranking is pretty tough. Um, but in a kayak, you've kind of got to figure out a variation, excuse me. What works for me may not work for everybody else. Um, but I've. I think I've developed my own system to a pretty effective um, way to throw some deeper diving crankbaits that you wouldn't typically do. Where I actually struggle now is when uh, I have a friend that, you know, asked me to be a co during a tournament on their boat. And, you know, I'm like my whole world is thrown upside down for the first hour of the morning because I'm like, what am I doing right now? Like, not used to this standing all the time, you know, uh, but for the Mirage drive, I have to sit to be able to pump, you know, my pedals and adjust the rudder and the pedal control as well. So um, I think it helps to a certain extent, not all extents, um, because sometimes it often forces me to pause to readjust. And I think getting into the routine on deep diving where you just, you know, because on a good rod and reel setup, where well, you can really send those things a mile, and you have to to make them reach their target diving depth and all that. But 
uh, you know, the crank and wine, crank and wine, and just not, you know, doing something different. Adjust. It's like almost jerk bait fishing. You know, yeah, I get into a routine where it's like jerk, jerk, pause, jerk, jerk, pause. Where maybe it's like more beneficial to like jerk and then pause and let wait for longer. You know, it's breaking the the cadence. Yeah, and and there are differences. I mean, I think. I can speak to this since I, you know, being a boat angler, going to kayaking, it's like if you're, let's do the crankbait thing. An example is if you get one that pushes the crankbait, well, if you're on a boat, the first thing I can do is take a couple of steps back to right. make sure I keep tension. I can't do that in a kayak. And now no. it's my brain rewiring that I got to start pedaling backwards immediately. Right. Yeah. Don't just sit there and lock up and let him drag you. And it, and so there are some neat little like, okay, this is different. I need to think about, or boat control is the biggest one and that i can't play a fish like i would where i could run around the boat i can't do that especially when i did a small mouth tournament with treble hooks like that was thrilling um you so there are little subtle nuances that are quite interesting that you do need to take into consideration that you probably wouldn't have before but they will cost you fish if you don't think about it yeah you know and and looking back um on the lake anna event i lost one, I'm not going to sit here and say it was a 20 incher. I saw it. It appeared to be something that probably would have helped throughout the day. Um, but if you don't train, probably 30. Yeah, if if you don't train your mind to deal with adversity on tournament day, um, it's going to come and bite you. You know, that could have been the pivotal moment that turned my day to complete trash. And, you know, I look at anglers like professionals like John Cox. I don't think anything gets under that guy's skin. Mm -mm. Pretty cool, calm and collected. I'm sure he's had his moments. But, you know, I was talking to another angler about it. and It's kind of interesting if you had a cameraman over your shoulder live streaming to thousands of people you know how many bloopers do you have during a day of fishing oh. you like you know or or just things that go wrong so you lose a fish so what you get catch another one you know and it's really tough on the days that you're you're looking for a handful of bites it's one thing when it's quick fast and easy um but if you're throwing a treble hook bait, you kind of know that you live by the devil uh, the treble hook. You die by the treble hook. You do. You do. <laughs> it's no different with a whopper plopper top water bait. Um, things like that. You know, it's sometimes they pop off, you know, and, and they're all learning experiences. Sure. You've got to go back at the end of the day and ask yourself the question. Is it me? Was it the rod? Was it something else? You know, what was the fish doing that got off and, and, and make adjustments. But I, you know, I never let that get to me. I try not to, I try and move on. And the greatest part is, is none of this stuff is, is life. I mean, it's life changing. Sure. But, um, it's not my job. It's a, uh, it's a hobby. It's a, it's a passion of mine. So, Bad days are going to happen and good days are going to happen. And you try and capitalize as many good days as you can. So, Do you do you do anything to your crankbaits? Um, do you adjust the treble hooks, change treble hooks out? Uh, what line size do you use? Are you using braid or fluorocarbon? Like what, what are you using? On my deep diving setups, 10-pound fluorocarbon, standard across the board. Um, oh, wow. Yep. Uh, red label. Uh, I've got, you know, and that's, that's the other thing too, is having confidence in your equipment. Um, 10 pound, uh, tie a very good knot. Um, you know, I, I like to consider myself a very good knot tire. Um, and I kind of hang my hat on that. I, people have watched me do it. If I don't think that that knot tasted right. I'll retie it. Mm. Um, it's not a, that'll do. That'll never do. Cause that's a, why spend $200 on a rod? 
if you're going to put a 50 cent effort into tying a knot, you know, one, and one awesome, doesn't fix yeah. the other. No, you're, it's a system, right? It's a system. Yeah. Become and, and proficient. And you don't want a piece. Yeah. And you don't want a piece of that system to, to fail. And if you don't fix the knot, it doesn't matter about the other parts of the system. And it's also like, I would just say also like, don't be afraid to cut and retie. Cause if you're using 10 pound test to crank, or I know some people in the Shenandoah and upper Potomac, they use uh, eight for like little uh, BFS crank baits for small mouth. Sure. And that lands banging into a bunch of trees and rocks. You're going to eat that big old crank bait and it's going to keep going. So don't yeah. be afraid to check your line. Yeah. I, I retie. Um, I don't overly retie. Um, but I always run my, my finger down the, so for instance, when I'm casting rip wraps tough on line, um, your, your bait is deflecting. It should be if you're, if you're not, if you're not bouncing off of what, you know, I wore two DT tens out on Saturday, like wore them out. Nice. Um, and that's that's what you're supposed to do. I mean, I wore the bill off of the first one, and the second one's I'm looking at it now. It's pretty well, pretty well tattered. Um, subsequently, the line's going to get involved with there, and generally, I you know just three feet, you know, half an arm's full distance, and just run my finger up when the line's wet, and you can generally feel when that line is starting to get, you know, the abrasion is taking set. And, and tie a quick knot and it takes gosh it takes 30 seconds and could save you a, you know a nice fish so alex you know thank you so much for coming on tonight i really appreciate it congrats on your win at lake anna um do you have any sponsors or anyone that you would like to to give a shout out to yes i do um first and foremost is always Delaware Paddle Sports. Um, Brian and John, the owners of Delaware Paddle Sports, they take such good care of me. Um, they're family. Um, they're my cheerleaders when I do well. They're they're my counselors when I do poor. Um, and they bend over backwards for me and their customers, and uh, they value your dollar tax-free uh, in Lewis, Delaware. Um, and I don't just say that they, they really are the, the one-stop shop. You, you, if you've ever been there, you'll know exactly what I'm saying. It's such a welcoming feeling. It's a hangout feeling. It's not a, you know, it, it doesn't feel like a retail setup. It feels like you're becoming part of the family. So Delaware paddle sports, I wouldn't be here without them. Hobie, obviously, um, you know, back in me, uh, I rod Matt Newman, um, awesome rods They're, you know, in my opinion, I went for, I, I completely, uh, melted away my St. Croix, um, stable and have replaced them with I rod. I believe in them. Um, time and time again, they, they proved me right. And then, uh, Trey Leach with innovative sportsman. Um, I don't let anybody else touch my kayak. Uh, there's not a person on the world that, you know, is, uh, I, I don't think there's a, there's a better fabricator, a better, uh, kayak rigging genius than him. Uh, because what stands him out from the rest is he's able to manufacture his own modifications. Um, and, uh, he, I mean, my kayak that he, that he put together for me, it's a dream to fish out of. It absolutely is. I, I've got nothing but great things to say about him. He's a great person. He's also my travel partner for when we uh, go to distance oh, cool. tournaments. So I've always got a, uh, a repair guy on the, uh, you know, on the, Hey, that worked out. <laughs> the, no, it works out good. He's uh his family's awesome. He's, he's a great family guy, great business. They're actually, they've just released, uh, he's got his own kayak out now and you should the probably inflatable. talk to him about it. The inflatable is the osprey um i've had the opportunity to fish that kayak i've had an opportunity to try and flip the kayak and i was successful but it was very very hard 
Um, and I think Jeff Little's got videos of that. Um, but awesome guy, awesome people. And then once again, NVKBA, Mike Ortega, everybody behind the scenes that helps that organization run out. I am, I'm so indebted to all these people that run these great tournaments around here because no matter whether you go north, go south, go east, go west, there's a good tournament series to be run. And kind of coming from an administrative side on a tournament, it's hard. It's really hard to build yourself a successful tournament series because, you know, you're trying to make a pool of 150, 200, 500, 1,000 people happy is an extremely difficult task anymore. So kudos to them. They run awesome series. The anglers at NVKBA are awesome. Everybody that I, mm -hmm. you know, was able to meet at Lake Anna, they're all good people. Um, if you've thought about jumping in the game, look them up. They're, uh, they're a great series. And then obviously MAKBF, who I fish with locally here in Maryland, they're another great organization. They've become friends, they've family. So I just thank you to all of them. Guys, as always, link in the episode description, everything we talked about today, including a list of Alex's sponsors. Again, Alex, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Guys, like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out, the YouTube algorithm and the Apple algorithm. We are now the top 200 uh, fishing podcasts in the whole nation right now as of April, which is pretty cool. So, guys, please keep it going now, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.